This is the interior of northern Labrador, a cold, lonely place, especially in the wintertime when the wind knifes down from the Arctic. A barren land, the sturdiest of trees struggle to survive. Man has always shunned this country, regarding it as a wild, desolate, forbidding wilderness, cruel, unyielding. But there are some who look at it in an entirely different light. To them it is not wilderness, it is their land, it is home. They alone among men have lived here for hundreds, perhaps for thousands of years. They are the Naskapi, or as they often call themselves, the people of the barren grounds, the Mushwa Inu. The life of the Mushwa Inu is intertwined with the caribou. In fact, without the caribou, they could not have survived in this land. Etik, they call the caribou, a special creature indeed to these northern Indians, at the very heart of their culture, affecting their spiritual and physical lives. Vast herds roam the barren grounds, searching for the lichens and sedges which blanket the wind-swept ground. They are constantly moving, searching for new range, migrating from the towering Torngat Mountains of the Labrador coast to the shores of Ungava Bay. Not so many years ago, the Indians followed the caribou all over this vast country. They remained self-sufficient and aloof in this wild, cold, barren land that nobody wanted, the Mushwa. Their dependence on the caribou was complete. It supplied all their needs. All the meat was consumed. Clothing, moccasins, tents, drums, all came from the caribou. The bones and antlers became tools and weapons and ornaments. The marrow was saved for special feasts. There was no waste. It was more, though, than a physical dependence was a deep-rooted spiritual bond between hunter and prey. This was, and still is, reflected in the hunting songs of the old men, hunting songs which come from dreams and visions of the country and of the animals. Indian sometimes dreams. This is why he sings. The old man usually plays the drum and sings at the same time after having had a dream. The dream tells him of something important and he tells about it while he is singing. He can understand the dream and the message gives him the direction to take in hunting, what to do and where to go. I suspect that even white men have dreams like old Indians. Nearby, a crowd of Indian children play street hockey, a crowd of kids with a different kind of dream. This is the first generation to be born and raised in houses, the first to come under the spell of television and the slap shot. What are their dreams? Of the caribou in the country, or of playing hockey in the Goose Bay Arena like their big brothers are doing tonight? Yes, change has finally come to the Indians of Labrador, the last of the nomadic caribou hunters. The old ways are rapidly eroding. Many fear they will soon vanish forever. Not if Philip Rich can help it. He returns home to the barren lands each year with his family to hunt, to fish, to show his children what it is to live close to the land, to show them the old ways. The contrasts are startling a piece of caribou roasting by the hot tin stove, a boy tugging on his store-bought boots. 
his mother taking the vellum from a caribou skin, the way it's been done for a thousand years. Philip and Monique were born and raised here under canvas in the country. They remember. The ties are still strong. The skills have not been lost. They have a strong attachment to this so-called barren land. This is home. The children were born in Davis Inlet, out on the coast, and go to school there. They take their school books with them, books written in a foreign language, and of a way of life that seems both strange and irrelevant here in the interior of Labrador. And so the old and the young, the modern and the traditional, blend together here in the country. <laughs> There's now a strong and growing movement back to the land, a return to old values, a need to renew ties with the country, an awareness that something very special is in danger of being lost. There's fresh meat to be had here in the country, far superior to store foods. The caribou, the porcupine, the ptarmigan, the hare. And there are basic skills to be learned and passed on. And there's the pride of rediscovery from the older generation of a way of life and a cultural identity which is unique and worth preserving. <laughs> Philip Rich welcomes the chance to take his 14-year-old son, Nook, caribou hunting with him. The Nascopi are great travelers. They have to be, for this country is vast, and their prey, the caribou themselves, are great travelers, always moving, searching for new feeding grounds. Lots of tracks this morning, but they aren't too fresh. And so the hunters, two men and a boy, continue on, hour after hour, over the frozen land. There's much for young Nook to learn. How to read the signs, how to judge the wind, how to approach the caribou. There is much he can learn from his father and from the other hunters who were born and raised in this land. The reason I am teaching my son the Indian way of life is so that he may be able to follow the tracks of his ancestors that he may follow the pathways in the country where years ago they used to walk. He likes school and he wants to learn, but I think he'd rather be in the country. The more he sees of it, the more he likes it. He wants to learn about this way of life. If he has children, he will be able to teach them the way I taught him. He will have a lot to teach them. Then they can follow. If he cannot teach them, that's where our way of life as Indians will end. Nook will learn, too, that there is more in this supposedly barren land than caribou. For while he is hunting, his aunt is fishing. There are streams and lakes near the tent. That's one reason why his father picked this place to camp in. Whitefish, suckers, and the lake trout, the cookamish, abound in the waters of Labrador. A good source of food while the Indians wait for the caribou. Food that the women can catch while the men are away on the barrens. Nook's mother, Monique, will prepare the fish, and in the evenings in the camp, they will eat and talk and plan the morrow. Sometimes old hunters tell stories of the way it used to be. They tell of trips they made and things they did a long while ago. This man has traveled all over this country. He killed his first caribou when he was 15 years old with a bow and arrow. Nook may hear of the days when the Nascopi would be joined by their sister tribe, the Montagnier, at the barren ground river, the Mushwa Shibu. 
Here they would watch for the migrating caribou. Then, when the animals were in the water, they would dash out from the shore on their canoes, paddle out among the forest of antlers, and kill the swimming caribou with spears. Some of the older people can remember hunting this way, and they can remember, too, the corrals they'd build along its banks, where they'd trap and kill caribou with bow and arrow. It was a great place for caribou with a mushwa shibu, but that was a long time ago. Only the old hunters remember the great hunts on the mushwa shibu. The old ways have changed, yet the caribou hunt itself remains an important part of life to these northern Indians. The meat is preferred above all others. The skin is still used for snowshoes and moccasins, and there are other reasons for hunting. Hunting is a test of strength and endurance, of skill and knowledge, a measure of the hunter's worth as a man. For this is a hunting culture. These are a people who have developed over the centuries an intimate knowledge of this land and how to survive here. Great distances are covered, 40 to 50 miles in a day, a steady, relentless pace over the frozen ground. The track of a caribou. A glance tells the hunters when the animal passed by and spurs them on. This is the best time of year for traveling. The air is bracing, the marshes and lakes frozen hard. The hunters continue, mile after mile over the barrens, through the scant patches of woods, searching for caribou, tracking, looking for signs, practicing the skills of their fathers. They stop every few hours for tea and bread, to gather their strength and to plan the next move. And so Philip and many of the other hunters pass on to the young men all they know about life on the Mushwa, the skills of tracking and survival, their knowledge of the caribou and its habits, and the qualities that make a man a good hunter, a good provider. The hunter must learn to be strong, to be patient, to hide his disappointment when at the end of a long day he realizes that they have just missed the herd, that the caribou have escaped, that the hunter must wait for another day. There have been times, though, when the Indians knew real hunger, when starvation stalked their camps. One hundred starved to death in the 1840s. Over 200 perished in the winter of 1892. Astonishing and unnecessary tragedies. For they did not fail as hunters. They had been encouraged by traders to leave the caribou, to trap fur, and when provisions promised did not arrive, they were caught far from the herds. It was a bitter lesson. The survivors returned to the nomadic life they knew and understood. Then, just after the turn of the century, and for some unexplained reason, the caribou herd began a steady decline. Faced again with the threat of starvation, the Indians retreated to the coast. This was in 1916. It was a new and unfamiliar life on the coast. Fishing and seal hunting did not appeal to nomadic hunters, yet they could not really return to the empty barrens. Welfare became common, alcohol a real problem. Some moved 200 miles south to the community of Northwest River to join a sister tribe, the Montagnier. Eventually, a few years ago, they all moved into houses. The last of the northern nomadic tribes had finally settled down but it was a troubled transition for the people of the barren grounds. Then, gradually, and as mysteriously as they had disappeared, the caribou began to increase. The herd, once feared to be on the way to extinction, began to multiply at an unbelievable rate. Today, the northern herd numbers 200,000. It's the largest caribou herd in the world, 
and it's still increasing rapidly. The Indians now living at Davis Inlet are still close enough to get to the herd, but only in the wintertime. But for the Northwest River Band, the herd is simply too far away. Besides, they're now tied to houses and schools and schedules, the young rooted in a new way of life. The old nomadic ways are no more. No longer are there Indian tents along the Moshwa Shibu, which is just across the border in Quebec territory. The great hunt which once took place on this river each fall is but a tribal memory. The only camps there now are those of the white man. They fly here through Shefferville, from Montreal and New York to hunt the caribou, to get a costly taste of northern life. It's a different kind of hunt. While some may be mostly interested in the meat, there are many more interested in the trophy. The northern caribou migrate back and forth across provincial boundaries and are managed by two provinces. Newfoundland does not permit non-resident sports hunting. In Quebec, it is a legitimate industry. Fly-in camps dot the Mushwa Shibu. 2,000 animals are taken. In all, 7,000 are taken in Quebec, 2,000 in Newfoundland. Though there's a year-round season for native peoples in Labrador, there are many who cannot hunt. They are trapped by the new way of life. The hunters of Northwest River are angry and frustrated at the situation in which they find themselves. They are particularly upset at the game laws, which they feel infringe on their traditional rights. The sad fact is that nearby herds have been depleted and Indians do not have the money to fly in as white men do. It's frustrating for them not to be able to hunt caribou as they once did, to be unable to get fresh meat. It's especially hard for the old hunters who remember the old traditions, who have lived a way of life that is no more, who have watched their people change, their customs die. Young Indians, educated now in the white man's world and aware of the problems their people face, search and fight for solutions, for ways in which the Indians of Labrador can survive in the modern world without losing all that is rich and beautiful from the past. camp at Border Beacon on the edge of the northern herd. Not a typical traditional camp. There are no women, no children. A two-way radio keeps the hunters in touch with the outside world. An airplane chartered by the Northwest River Band Council brought them here and will bring out the caribou meat. Sharing is part of the Indian tradition. These men, some Nascapi, some Montagnier, came here to get meat for the elders of the community those who can no longer hunt for themselves. Flying into the country is now the only solution for the Indians of Northwest. It's a strange new kind of hunt for the Indians, especially for those who remember the old ways. Under Edward Rich's skillful hand, a rat tail file becomes a rifle sight. The talk turns to hunting, to the caribou, as the hunters make their plans and think of the old people back in Northwest who will be so happy to have fresh meat. A good day for hunting, crisp and clear. Edward chops firewood, and a whisker jack flirts about the camp. This means good luck will be with the hunters. They climb out of the sheltered valley where they've set up camp, heading for the high open country, the windswept barrens where the caribou will be feeding.
As they travel, they read the signs and remember the places that have special meaning. The mother of one of the hunters was born here. The old skills come back. They have not been forgotten. The hunt was good. The caribou have been killed. There is enough now for all the elders back in Northwest. It's a good feeling, but now the real work begins. A savage wind begins to cut its way across the barrens. But the caribou cannot be left behind. And so the hunters return with their caribou to their homes in Northwest River. The caribou are skinned and quartered, a job Edward Rich has done a thousand times. Tonight there will be a feast, a celebration. There will be dancing, and he will play his drum and sing his hunting song. And the young people will learn a bit more about the life and the customs of their ancestors. The feast begins, the ritual of the Mokashan, the celebration of the hunt. It is not as it was. The auditorium of the school in Northwest River has replaced the tent of the successful hunter. Cardboard cups and plates seem strangely out of place. Yet the core, the spirit of the Mokashan, remains the same. The bone marrow of the caribou, cooked and chilled, is eaten carefully. The old hunters eat first, then the men who kill the caribou then the women and children. There is an awakening among the Indians of Labrador today, a new awareness of their unique culture, of their identity as a people, a new interest in preserving their language, their legends, their rituals, a desire to regain as much as possible the traditional patterns of life a new feeling of closeness with the land, a demand to have a voice in the way in which it's developed. And so the dreams of the hunters are woven into a dance. The old men drum and sing their songs. The 
the others dance to a rhythm as old perhaps as the tribe itself. Memories return of hunting trips of long ago, of the caribou and the other animals of the barrens, of life on the country, the mushwa, the barren grounds of northern Labrador. It may never be the same again. The old ways cannot return. But perhaps there can be a better blend of the old and the new. Perhaps the young will break new trails. Perhaps the white men will have dreams like old Indians. Dave Quinton's film on the people of the barren grounds was photographed by Nigel Markham, sound man Kevin Hanlon, and the film was edited by Lloyd Pinnell. I'm Don Franks, and the executive producer of this land is John Lackey. <laughs>